everybody. Um, the topic is Indigenous Studies, but we are, in fact, not running on Indian time. We're going to start right on uh, 5.15. Uh, my name is Jenny Davis, and I am faculty in American Indian Studies, Anthropology, and Gender and Women's Studies. And today, I am very happy to do the introduction for our esteemed panel of guests and speakers. To begin with, I would like to begin by recognizing and acknowledging that we are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Wea, Miami, Mascouten, Ottawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. <laughs> these lands were the traditional territory of these native nations and still are prior to their forced <laughs> removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and our struggles for survival and identity. As a land-based institution, the University of Illinois has a particular responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution for the past 150 years. We are also obligated to reflect on and actively address these histories and the role this university has played in shaping them. This acknowledgement and the centering of Native peoples is a start as we move forward for the next 150 years. Um, so as promised, I'm going to introduce our speakers and hand over the floor. Um, this is a new format, I believe, for the unit, um, where instead of a single presenter, we have three presenters um, working together, and they represent three of our fellow institutions here in the state of Illinois. Um, we have Kelly Weiskup, who's coming to us from Northwestern in the Department of English and the CNAIR Center. We have Haley Negrin in History at the University of Illinois at Chicago. And we have Teresa Montoya uh, in anthropology at the University of Chicago. Kelly Weiskut specializes in Native American literatures, early American literatures, and science and literature in the Atlantic world. She is the author of two books, Medical Encounters, Knowledge and Identity in Early American Literature, Literatures, um, from the <laughs> University of Massachusetts Press in 2013. And uh, the second book, Good News from New England, by Edward Winslow, a scholarly edition um, from the University of Massachusetts Press as well from 2014. She is currently completing a Assembled Relations, Compilation, Collection, and Native American Writing on Native American Literary Interventions into Colonial Sciences of Collecting. By examining Native compilations, non-narrative genres like lists, catalogs, and scrapbooks, the book charts an untold story about archives, science, and colonialism that shaped the uses, uh, uses for and conceptions of Native American literature from the 18th and 19th centuries to the present. Haley Negrin specializes in Native American history, slavery, and the history of women and gender in the Atlantic world. Her current book project investigates the transformation of indigenous kinship ties and politics under English chateau slavery in early North America. Using a mix of colonial and ethno-historical sources, she tracks how Southeastern Native American women and children specifically were targeted and trafficked from their own sovereign borders into Carolina and Virginia plantations in the 17th century. She considers how they reimagined community, politics, <coughs> and relationships to the natural world, even while under the deep stress of bondage. And Teresa Montoya is a social scientist and media maker trained in sociocultural anthropology, critical indigenous studies, and filmmaking. Her current manuscript project, Permeable, Diné Politics of Extraction and Exposure, it approaches territorial dispossession and environmental contamination in and around the Navajo Nation as pervasive features of contemporary indigenous life. Drawing from Diné, some of you might know it as Navajo, oral histories and, the, and ethnographic research, her project engages local modes of relating, both in its political and kinship imaginings to understand the entanglements of railroad, checkerboard, land allotment, and contestations over sovereignty and jurisdiction among Diné communities of present-day northern Arizona and New Mexico in relation to these toxic legacies. Both her academic, beyond her academic work, she has curatorial and museum education experience in various institutions. She is Diné and a citizen of the Navajo Nation. Please join me in welcoming these. <laughs> oh, do I need that one too? Yeah. Okay. The double mic situation. Okay. Oh, good thing I have two pockets. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, is the mic on? Can people hear? Okay, great. 
Um, thank you so much for the invitation to come and speak with you all as part of the um, Modern Criticism Lecture Series. Thanks to Sarah and Letty for your work in organizing and welcoming us um, and for all of the labor um, to bring us here and make this talk happen. I want to start by talking a little bit about the format for our talk as I understand it's a little bit unusual um, for this series. So I'll talk a little bit about where the idea to bring uh, or to have three of us um, here came from and a little bit about what we're trying to do around this collaborative um, event. So we are three scholars from three different disciplines as Jenny's introduction um, showed. I'm a literary scholar, Haley Negrin is a historian, Teresa Montoya is an anthropologist and also a filmmaker. Native American and indigenous studies methodologies are central to our respective research and are also the basis for our collaborations today. They emerge out of conversations we've had out of a new and growing Chicagoland Native Studies working group over the past year. It's a space to share work, um, to collaborate, to hopefully build interconnections among our institutions. Um, our talks today are also coming out of longer conversations in our own disciplines about how Native Studies might transform traditional disciplinary formations and methodologies. So we hope that the collaborative nature of our talk will open up a conversation with you all about collaboration within and among universities and disciplines. Collaboration among scholars, native and non-native, and between scholars and tribal historians, knowledge keepers, and other community members is central to native studies. And so we hope to model some of those methodologies that we're discussing today. <coughs> I wanna emphasize that this is as much an experimental practice for us as it is an invitation for you to join us in that collaboration. We hope we can build a conversation about Native Studies and its methodologies and how they might reorient or challenge or add to methodologies in your own fields. So we'll each talk about our own work in relationship to our discipline and Native Studies. We'll discuss some of the ways that Native Studies might transform objects of disciplinary study and the methodologies for examining them. We'll each also take up a concrete object or moment with which to think about Native Studies in relation to our respective fields. These talks are speculative in nature. We are not presenting final conclusions, but inviting you into conversations we've been having about our fields, our methods, and our objects of study. So we hope that our materials will be useful for you to think with um, about objects in your own fields, about the structures of your fields, and so on. And here, we're interested in how disciplines have constituted native people and knowledge as objects of study, and how disciplines might delimit some of the questions that we ask. We're interested in how Native Studies might open up other kinds of questions and avenues for research within and also outside of our disciplines. So we're building here from Jay Kealani Kawanui's argument in the piece that we circulated on settler colonialism, um, in which she argues that questions of indigeneity are essential to understanding, as she says, aspects of American culture, politics, policy, and society. So for example, the US Republic can't be understood without accounting for the violent removal of its original occupants. At the same time, settler colonialism still produces effective networks that structure lived conditions that orient settler governmentality. So we wanna think through some of these questions around colonialism, effective networks, gender, and governmentality in our own fields, even as we also ask how Native Studies might help those disciplines to, to privilege the study of and with indigenous people, not just the concept of indigeneity. So I wanna start us off by thinking about how disciplinary structures um, got produced and stabilized at a particular moment, and to think about the repercussions of those disciplinary structures for multiple fields and lived experiences. So the work in which I'm drawing is around my research tracing the circulation of Native literatures within some of those disciplinary structures in order to try to sharpen and complicate our understandings of disciplines and some of their effects, especially in literary history, the field in which I primarily work. And so here I'm interested in expanding Audra Simpson's argument, tracing how the disciplinary structures of anthropology have worked to fix Native people within categories of culture, belief, tradition, authenticity, and difference by creating and reproducing categories of knowledge. I'm gonna think about how those categories don't just require indigenous people to be recognizable in certain ways, but also produce practices of reading that end up being important for literary history and that get replicated across multiple fields, social formations, and historical contexts. And here, I'm particularly interested in what Simpson calls scenes of apprehension. She defines these as spaces of discernment that distill into representations or renderings of difference that govern the ways that we know things. 
So in what follows, I'll trace a few scenes of apprehension in 19th century archives and ask how then turning to native books might ask us to look at those archives from other angles. I want to emphasize that my own disciplinary context is key to my thinking here about these 19th century scenes of apprehension. I'm trained as an early Americanist, someone working in the period before the 20th century, depending on who you talk to, um, and a moment when those scenes of apprehension receive crucial formulations in university departments, in archives, in museums. This is a moment when places like the Newberry Library, the American Antiquarian Society, the Field Museum, the Smithsonian Institution, all are forming or receiving crucial um, formation, funding, and um, kind of mission statements. These are institutions that now support early American scholarship and the scholarship in other fields. And so I'm interested in the stakes of producing research out of institutions formed at this particular moment in the 19th century um, and thinking about what those moments of formation might tell us about the kinds of knowledge that archives and other institutions produce. So I'm interested in thinking through the ways in which um, this period is one in which the materials of the field that I work in were gathered, arranged, cataloged, and ordered in institutions. And I want to think about how those processes took place and what cons consequences they still have. A key context for me in thinking about this is another collaborative project that I worked on for like the last three or four years. Um, and that's a project um, with the journals Early American Literature and the William and Mary Quarterly, so leading journals of early American literature and early American history. Um, in which co-editors and I called on scholars in those fields to account for Native Studies methodologies within their fields. We found that the call we were making continued a call that had been made at least since the 19th century when Native historians began to argue that their history should be told by their own people. Um, we also found, as we traced the patterns of publication in those journals, that Native authors and people pr figured primarily in those journal articles as representations within colonial texts rather than as authors or agents in their own right. Um, and so one of the things that I'm interested in thinking through is how colonial archives end up having that power to produce these representations and how those representations end up being taken to represent um, an entire field, native literary history, um, rather than um, the many, many works that native people are producing throughout the 18th and 19th centuries. We could return to Simpson again here too and to think about the ways that ethnographic categories of knowledge are a form of politics that is actually more than representational, that are governmental and disciplinary possessions of bodies and territories. And I think what this means for the archives formed in the 18th and 19th centuries is that there are sites where producing knowledge is intertwined with possessing both bodies and land. Scenes of apprehension produce reading practices for assembling native bodies, lands, and literatures and these reading practices are replicated as methodologies in archival arrangements and commentary. So I want to think through how the formation of the archives that now support scholarship in multiple fields happened, and I want to think with you all about how Native Studies methodologies can throw practices of knowledge, production, and possession into relief and also potentially divert them. So this question of knowledge, production, and diversion is exemplified for me in two objects. The first on the left, a map from the Bureau of American Ethnology that attempts to collate indigenous languages with place and to locate both within United States and Canadian international and state boundaries. And second, a book of vocabulary lists and dialogues in the Abenaki language, published in 1884 by Joseph Laurent, a leader of an Abenaki town at Odenac in Quebec. The map was the result of decades of research by Bureau of American Ethnology employees and other men, soldiers, traders, Indian policy officials, all employed by the Bureau to collect words throughout the West as the US Army is also waging a war of dispossession against native nations. The collecting project was not merely linguistic or even ethnological in nature. Bureau of American Ethnology director John Wesley Powell defined the Bureau's immediate purpose in collecting native language words as, and I'm quoting from him here, the discovery of the relations among the Native American tribes to the end that amicable groups might be gathered on reservations. This practical demand for the early researches conducted by the Bureau led directly and unavoidably to an innovation in ethnic classification. That's all Powell. So in Powell's comment, the creation of ethnic classifications holds hands with the dispossession of indigenous lands. 
and both rely on words assembled into vocabulary lists on paper, circulated, collated with other vocabulary lists, and eventually mapped onto geographic space. So the different colors on this map for Powell represent what he believes are linguistic families. Imagining relations between the United States and Native nations who would be, in Powell's words, gathered on reservations, not only facilitates US expansion onto supposedly surplus or empty lands, but also produced categories through which colonists claim to know and govern Native people. Attaching languages to places didn't just or even at all reflect the place-based nature of language. The Bureau's project fixed indigenous people within US boundary lines, maps, and visions of space. And it's a little hard to see at this distance, but while the map is, is mapping and representing language families, it maintains state boundary lines within the United States and also boundary lines dividing the US and Canada. This process of fixing people in place, as Mashana Goman's work on native feminisms and mapping has shown, also produced gender, labor, and geographic categories that disrupted indigenous families and languages and attempted to separate people and homelands. Moreover, native lands are essential in Powell's vision to colonial maps of language, tribal relations, and reservations. For collectors transformed native lands on paper into a category for ordering and arranging. Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, collectors made massive archival collections containing taxonomies of native words and lists of tribal nations in order to try to contain native nations on paper. Here are just two of them. The one on the left is from Thomas Jefferson's Notes on the State of Virginia. It's his catalog that runs for a couple of pages of Native American nations um, west of the Appalachians. And he is trying to, to collate the names of Native nations with a final category on the far right, where they reside. So trying to place people in geographic space. And the table on the right is Albert Gallatin's um, table of Indian tribes, again, trying to locate tribes in place. Uh, so 1785 and then 1836 is Gallatin's table. Um, so in these tables, taxonomies, maps, and charts produced to list and order native languages, collectors attempted to transform indigenous homelands into an organizing feature, a heading for a column, a principle of arrangement, a location pinpointed on a map. They use these ordering features to locate native nations on paper and to represent indigenous lands as bounded and increasingly as contained within the United States. It's on these tables, catalogs, and maps where native lands serve an ordering function, where paper claims meet political boundaries, and where collectors imagine historical, culture, and political relations between the US and native nations. So in other words, all of this paper is being made in order to perpetuate claims that often exist only on paper, but that don't grasp the actual ongoing nature of native homelands and sovereignty. So there's a lot of paper made. It doesn't always correspond to reality. Land's presence within archival arrangements demonstrates the extent and effects of the interconnections among settler colonialism, collecting practices, and colonial archives. And desire for indigenous lands structures those archives determining how materials were arranged and read and permeating literary, ethnographic, and historical categories. So turning now to my second object, it's also the case that native books circulated through these archives. And so I'll turn now to ask what archival pathways and methodologies might be visible if we trace the travels of native books into and out of archives. So the book here, New Familiar Abenaki's English Dialogues, was also held at the Bureau of American Ethnology. It was sent there just a few years after the map and Powell's commentary were published. The dialogues contain vocabulary lists of Abenaki words, grammatical instruction, and dialogues, sentences that people would say back and forth to each other in English and Abenaki. It's also still used today as a language text for Abenaki communities. Um, it's a book that is, was on the shelves of the Abenaki leaders and tribal historians I talked to while doing this research. It's a book people talk about um, Xeroxing and circulating in order to learn the language. Around 1884, around the same time the book is published, Joseph Laurent sent a copy to the Bureau's clerk, James Pilling. And so the image on the right is from the inside of this book um, where an envelope has been pasted into the front cover um, in Laurent's hand showing that he has addressed a copy of this book to the chief clerk of the Bureau of American Ethnology. That's Pilling. By sending the book to the Bureau, Laurent circulated the dialogues into the heart of linguistic collecting in the United States. But rather than circulate 
as an effect of Powell's archival collecting and arranging, the book maps its own itineraries, traveling with a romp back and forth as he traveled across the U.S.-Canadian border. This is throughout Abenaki homelands, as Laurent is traveling south to New Hampshire in the summers, where he runs a summer camp where he and other Abenaki people sell baskets to tourists and then return home in the winters. The book also circulates into D.C., um, going into a space interested in collecting indigenous languages. But unlike the Bureau's view of collecting as a mode of preservation that would compensate for Native people's expected vanishing and would plot a, a narrative of assimilation, Laurent did not position linguistic research as an act of rescue or archival stabilization. Instead, the dialogues is an object that invites interaction, speaking, circulation, and further uses. The form of the dialogue, these sentences that people say back and forth to each other, um, imagines people speaking to and with one another, sharing the book, handing it back and forth, speaking in English and also in Abenaki. So even as it enters into the Bureau's archives as an ethnobibliographic object, the dialogues posits contrasting uses for and ways of interacting with the word lists. Uses that refuse acts of categorizing words and people in hierarchical templates or on a map of the United States. You can trace some of these practices by turning to a second copy of the book. Uh, it's now held at Amherst College in their special collections and it's inscribed with Laurent's daughter's signature. So the box on the right um, is around Octavie Laurent's signature. Her full name is Marie Octavie Laurent. The inscription in her copy of the book suggests that the dialogues complemented the materials in English, Abenaki, and French that were available to students attending Odenak schools, and that the book would have fulfilled the goal that Laurent stated of teaching Wabanaki children English, a language useful both in Quebec and in exchanges with people in the United States. Octavie's copy and its uses demonstrate that the Abenaki language isn't a static system to be transferred to paper and used as a geographic template for reservations, but a tool in the mouths of Abenaki children. The current home at Amherst for Octavie's copy also attests to the ways that the book continues to maintain relations among Abenaki people. The Amherst College copy came to reside there when in 2014, Rhonda Bisa, who is an Abenaki beater, sold this copy, Octavie's copy of the book, to the library. Bisa had obtained the book from a bookseller and she speculates that it might have been sold from the camp that Laurent kept in New Hampshire, but it's not clear how that copy ended up for sale. Bisa says that she decided Amherst collections were a good place for the book because, as she noted, I felt a responsibility as an Abenaki to receive and take care of this book in a good way. She further explained that she wanted the book to stay close to home and to go to somewhere or someone where it would be loved. These interactions with the dialogues, from Laurent sending a copy to the Bureau, to Laurent and Octavie traveling with the book across the US-Canadian boundary, to selling a book to an archive where it would be loved, open up ways of using archives that do not redound on disciplinary formations or categories of knowledge. Instead, the dialogues' travels highlight the ways that indigenous books might give rise to actions that exceed reading, writing, categorizing, taxonomy, taxonomizing in this way diverting the categories for framing native lands and language to produce instead interactions among language speakers and between people and a book. These interactions gloss alternate ways of using books, not for securing knowledge or attaching people or lands to paper, but for building relations among people, whether that be between Laurent and Powell or the imagined relations that Bisa envisions between the copy of the dialogues and readers who visit Amherst. These readers are certainly entangled with settler colonial systems, even as they refuse to be determined by them. And we might then ask what literary methodologies might attend to those entanglements without swallowing native literatures and nations within archives, maps, settler colonial states, or, or, or settler colonial states. Native studies pushes us to think beyond the paper claims to land that are made in settler colonial archives to the everyday practices like speaking and loving, in the case of the dialogues, that evade archival control and shape literary history around the circulations and uses for books. Native Studies pushes us as well to think about the places where indigenous literatures and books are made, read, and used, about archives as well as the indigenous homelands on which those archives rest. And with that, I'm gonna hand things over to Haley. So hang on while we do the double mic transfer. Why is that I have one's for the um, camera. 
Thank you. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Hello. Thank you so much for having us. I also want to thank Kelly so much for inviting both Teresa and I to do this lecture. So I'm going to start with a personal story. This summer, I was traveling through Cherokee, North Carolina with a few colleagues while doing research for my book project on the history of enslaved Native American women and children in the early American South. Cherokee is the heart of the Koala boundary, the home of the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. A tribal nation with about 15,000 members who trace their history back in this land roughly 11,000 years. The nation is nestled in the beautiful Smoky Mountains of North Carolina, which is good for tourism today, but wasn't great for land, uh, wasn't great land for cotton production or gold mining in the 1800s, which is one of the reasons Cherokees were able to remain here. While the majority of Cherokees were first westward on the Trail of Tears, where roughly, roughly 4,000 died, Eastern Band members descend from a group of about 800 Cherokees who hid out in the mountains, and some, it said, walked back from Oklahoma. Eventually, they purchased property that they call the Koala Boundary, and the federal government allowed them to keep it in trust. Uh, technically, it's actually not a reservation. Today, the Smokies bring tourism. Asheville, North Carolina, is only a few hours away, and hippies and backpackers often land in Cherokee on their way up the Appalachian Trail. Driving through town, there are government buildings, souvenir shops, a casino, a museum, and other businesses. As my friends and I, who are also historians, drove through the area, I noticed that images of Sequoia, the creator of the first Cherokee alphabet, seemed to be everywhere we looked. Yeah, there he is. Businesses sold reproductions of his famous portrait, originally painted by Charles Bird King in 1828. The portrait is uh, in every single US history textbook I've ever seen. Um, it depicts him pointing at his creation uh, while wearing a traditional Cherokee turban, and also uh, the Medal of Honor uh, that the Eastern Band gave him um, in 1824 for completing the alphabet. Um, driving up to the Museum of the Cherokee Indian, uh, there's a giant statue of Sequoia uh, that greets visitors. There's even a, a Sequoia bear uh, complete uh, with turban, pipe, and the Cherokee alphabet that will greet you as you're walking through town. Um, there's a Sequoia golf course. To Eastern Band members, I'm gonna leave it on, uh, I'll leave it on Sequoia. To Eastern Band members, Sequoia has become a crucial symbol of Cherokee pride and Cherokee sovereignty. As one of the most recognizable Cherokees in the world, his image has been, become synonymous with the Cherokee nation itself. This is important because we're living in a moment where native people often struggle to be visible, and Americans tend to be more familiar with native people as sports mascots, Disney characters, rather than in as intellectuals. Uh, for instance, uh, we were told at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian, one of the most common questions um, that the folks who run the museum get is, you know, where are the Cherokee princesses? Are they here? Um, it's a letdown when people have to explain that this doesn't exist. Uh, maybe Elizabeth Warren, I'm clear. <laughs> Sequoia's fame here really makes sense. It would be a difficult to overstate the uh, importance of the syllabary he created to Cherokee sovereignty or the amazing nature of his achievement. Uh, he was not literate in any language and did not speak English, um, but after many manuscript revisions, he perfected a system of Cherokee writing. And this is in a moment uh, when Christian missionaries in particular um, are hoping that the Cherokee language is going to die right, in order to speed along the civilization process. When removal split the Eastern Band uh, from Cherokees that were forced west on the Trail of Tears, the syllabary helped to create a bridge between a separated people. Um, and and uh, Sequoia's uh, linguistic contribution and intellectual contribution really mimicked his diplomatic work. Uh, he tried to bring several separate um, Cherokee groups together, both in Oklahoma and in Mexico, with the Eastern Band. Uh, the syllabary also led to an extensive Cherokee print culture, which uh, Kelly could talk about far more than I could. Uh, the publishing of the Cherokee Phoenix, uh, the nation's official newspaper in Cherokee, and one of the first bilingual newspapers in the country. 
Cherokee Constitution was drafted and written in both English and Cherokee. And this helped to make Cherokee legal and intellectual traditions legible to settlers at a moment when removal was predicated on their lack of civilization and barbarity. Uh, when Andrew Jackson would argue that removal would allow Cherokees to, quote, cast off their savage habits and become an interesting, civilized, um, and Christian community. Uh, Cherokees would even begin to write their own histories um, in the syllabary. Sequoia's image stuck in my mind, uh, even though I studied Cherokee women in a much earlier period. Um, his life in the history of Indian removal is actually not really in my wheelhouse. Still, receiving good training as a historian of women and gender will make anyone attentive to gendered symbols and their power, hopefully. Sequoia is a Cherokee man. So as we were driving through town, I wondered what the implications might be that this image of a Cherokee man and Cherokee masculinity had somehow become synonymous with Cherokee culture and nationhood. It was how many Cherokee-owned businesses, the tribal government, um, and other in the museum uh, chose to think about and represent their nation. So I mentioned something to my friend in passing, who I'll call Anne for the purposes of the story. Anne is also a historian of women and gender in the Native South, and also a Native woman. I got an unexpected response. She turned towards me in the car and said pointedly, his wife Sally burned his manuscript, you know. So this is Cherokee wife Sally, Sally Benj. So this lesser known history uh, prompted quite a few questions for me. Did Sally not agree with the syllabary project? Was writing a colonial imposition in her eyes, a way of distorting Cherokee life and culture? Or was she angry about something, unrela on a, uh, something else unrelated in their marriage? How well known was the story? Um, and why did my native woman friend feel I needed to know about this, perhaps more inconvenient history of Sequoia's life? After some research, I discovered that historians don't really know much about why Sally burned Sequoia's manuscript. There are many books on Sequoia, but none on Sally. In books on Sequoia, it was difficult to even find much information on Sally. The woman who did the farm work and housekeeping that provided the material subsistence Sequoia needed to be able to write the manuscript. The woman who gave birth to four children um, were the first people that Sequoia taught the syllabary to. When she is mentioned, her actions generally fold into the larger controversy that surrounded the syllabary in the early years, when some Christian Cherokees, not understanding why, why Sequoia was sort of seen muttering to himself alone and, and writing unintelligible symbols down on paper, thought that he was perhaps involved in witchcraft. Um, it's also folded into the sort of discussion Chief John Ross um, had and his criticism where he said the syllabary was a waste of time. So this seemed problematic to me. Um, not only the lack of attention to Sally, but also the fact that when her resistance was mentioned, it was as if her complaints about the syllabary would manifest the same as John Ross's or any other person's. Like her position as Se Sequoia's intimate partner could be written out of the story of her feelings or her resistance to the project when it seemed material to me to consider how their intimate relationship influenced not only her life, Sequoia's life, but the development of the syllabary. But why Anne brought Sally up to me perhaps became even more important for me to consider. Being attentive to power relations is the work of a historian of women and gender. We all want scholars and the public to pay attention to women's stories when they haven't been told because patriarchy is a powerful force that can write women, children, and gender non-conforming people out of history if we're not careful. And we all want people to think about how gender functions in societies and influences power relations. And Anne is no different in this way. She's also interested in these things. But she's also expressed to me in the past that she feels that it's part of the lived experiences of many Native women today to feel that their unique positionality, their unique stories, their unique forms of rage go unacknowledged, both in public discourse and in academic circles. See, seeing Sequoia everywhere was all well and good, but Sally's story, like the stories of many Native women, was being neglected, and Anne wanted me to know that. And so, this is the call of indigenous feminist scholarship on the most basic level, to engage with Native women's stories. The readings reassigned here by Rachel Flowers, Mel Arvin, Eve Tuck, and Angie Morrill all call for scholars and the public to engage with indigenous women and indigenous issues. They call out older white stream forms of feminism still present in some gender and women's studies departments and ethnic studies departments, and argue that any reckoning with what feminism is is incomplete without thinking about indigenous women and their efforts. Forget about the first, second, and third waves, they might say. Native feminism existed in 1491. 
But what does engaging with Native women's stories actually mean? Sally's story brings up questions of inclusion. Sally's story in Sequoia's prominence, I guess, brings up questions of inclusion, of simply taking the time to do more work on women and gender in Indian country. What if we broaden our cast of characters? That can be useful. But, as these scholars argue, that alone is not what indigenous feminists are arguing for when they talk about using an indigenous feminist framework. In fact, as Rachel Flowers convincingly argues, trying to pull Native women into a multicultural or civil rights framework of feminism and inclusion is a colonial act in and of itself. This form of inclusion, linked to the politics of reconciliation, is about satisfying settlers who want to support Native women in theory, but do not want to unsettle themselves in reality which is what an earnest engagement with indigenous feminisms requires. These authors call on feminist scholars in gender and women's studies and other disciplines to actually change the terms of their analysis. They want scholars to include questions of sovereignty and colonialism in their work, to remember that colonialism is not over, but that native nations and native women are engaged in an ongoing struggle. Now the struggle to maintain sovereignty is not just a theoretical struggle rather is directly linked to the material realities of colonialism, which, as Flowers argues, quotes, quote, begins in the bodies of indigenous women. For example, the fight against domestic violence and sexual assault, which have long been important issues in feminist movements, takes on a different meaning when indigenous women are concerned. One only has to look at the startlingly high incidences of domestic violence and sexual assault perpetuated against native women by non-native men to see how colonialism manifests in native bodies and intimate lives in contemporary times. As Flowers explains, when we account for settler possession as a structure that continues to dispossess peoples from the land, there's a clear connection between the land and the bodies of indigenous women. You could say it another way, you cannot disentangle the issues native women, native women face from the issue their nations face. Violence against native women is so prevalent in part because the federal government has chipped away at tribal sovereignty. Oliphant v. Suquamish, a 1978 Supreme Court case, ruled that tribal courts do not have criminal jurisdiction over non-natives. The case, which was originally about a non-native man punching, punching a tribal police officer after a celebration, makes it extremely difficult to prosecute non-native men who commit crimes against native women. So the struggle for tribes to exercise jurisdiction and other meaningful forms of sovereignty in their territory is also a woman's struggle for safety and dignity. And court rulings in D.C. often have a string of unintended consequences in Indian country for women and families. Now, Eve Tuck and Morrill also call for scholars who are generally supportive of indigenous causes, but feel that their research has nothing to do with indigenous issues to, quote, reassess what indigenous theories are actually concerned with. This means looking into how settler colonialism impacts native people, but also how settler colonialism impacts structures and institutions at all levels of society even institutions and structures that seem to have little to do with Native people. As scholars in GWS, ethnic studies, and historians of women and gender have shown, race and gender are socially constituted. But indigenous feminist authors urge us to also remember that, quote, everyone living in the country is not only racialized and gendered, but also has a relationship to settler colonialism. Indigenous women are also often expected to respond to colonialism and the politics of reconciliation in particular ways. As Flowers explains, the unique position that indigenous women often play in communities can lend itself to superficial portrayals of indigenous women as earth mothers who have endless suppliers of love. Love for community, love for the earth, love for indigenous men, love for settlers. This can leave little room for rage, for refusal, and many of the other responses to living in a settler state that can lead to decolonization. As Flowers explains, in these portrayals, the taming of indigenous women's emotions is part of a pacification of what are seen to be negative or immobilizing emotions. Indig indigenous women's emotions move in a singular, linear direction that parallels the move to decolonization. As we move from colonization to decolonization, so too do indigenous women move from anger to love. And she's troubling this. So what would happen if scholars and historians of women and gender in Indian country in particular used rage as an analytical framework for studying indigenous women? How might Sequoia's story look different if we considered Sally's role in the development of the syllabary, if we considered her rage? How might Sally's story add to what we know about Cherokee people's responses to colonialism, 
Can we read Sally's decision to burn the manuscript as an act of refusal? Now the point here is not to actually draw conclusions about Sally's life or to deplatform Sequoia as an important national symbol. The goal, rather, is to suggest that there is merit for historians to use an indigenous feminist framework to approach her life and the lives of women like her. Her actions must be considered in conversation with the enormous pressures that Southern Native communities face in the era of removal, and also the specific reality of gendered power dynamics. Colonialism is layered, and Native women's experiences as gendered subjects requires that we pay attention to power relations at the level of the state, but also at the level of intimate relationships. This may reveal a different experience of colonialism that might not fit with the broader narrative at play that Native men like Sequoia experienced, which shaped their responses. Perhaps trying to be a wife, a Christian, and a Cherokee woman at the same time took Sally in different directions than her more famous husband. These directions warrant exploration if historians are to do justice to the complicated routes that colonialism can take and its gendered formations within intimate relationships, families, and communities. Thank you. And Teresa's up. a robot now. Like, <laughs> it's like hanging off my jewelry. Um, let's see. Let me switch this out. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Actually, this is really exciting to be here. It's nice to see a full house. Um, thank you to both Kelly and Haley for this wonderful introduction, I guess, to some of the things that I'm thinking through. Um, and I'm, I'm excited to see some of the connections that you're all drawing between our three talks. In my research, I analyzed the jur jurisdictional challenges for Diné residents and checkerboard communities, that is, communities located on parcels of land surrounded by, but not technically, a part of the Navajo Nation. In the Perco Valley of northern Arizona, this territorial arrangement is an artifact of the Atlantic Pacific Railroad constructed in the late 19th century. Border towns such as Gallup, Holbrook, and Winslow owe their establishment to the railroad. The unincorporated community of Sanders, seen here on the map, was also founded as a railroad stop. Totaling only 2.4 square miles, this island jurisdiction is home to just over 600 residents, most of whom are citizens of the Navajo Nation. In July 2015, just as I was beginning my ethnographic field work, oh. <laughs> um, Sanders residents were notified of uranium contamination in their local drinking water source. Indeed, on July 16, 1979, a United Nuclear Uranium Mill tailings disposal pond ruptured, releasing over 94 million gallons of acidic radioactive fluid into the Puerco River, which eventually flowed towards the community of Sanders. Years passed before the contaminants reached the groundwater, though it would be many more years before residents were notified of the exceedances. Once news spread, however, a group of community members, included, including extended family members with whom I was already working on a task force to shut down local liquor establishments, came together and started organizing to address the emergency situation. Because of the non-Navajo jurisdiction of this small community, their efforts required different strategies and approaches than their neighboring Diné communities. In my larger research, I theorized this sort of political arrangement in a longer trajectory of settler colonial land disposition, as well as an ongoing condition of legal ambiguity and what environmental justice scholars refer to as slow violence. However fraught, these political spaces of so-called absence also highlight the ways in which Navajo citizens strategically and necessarily move between multiple jurisdictions, leveraging discourses of human rights, tribal sovereignty, 
deontologies of kinship, and even private, private property ownership in overlapping and sometimes competing ways. In this way, articulating an actually Diné politic must move beyond the limited geopolitical frameworks of tribal sovereignty towards the everyday practices and ethics of sovereignty as self-determination. With this brief overview of my larger research project, I turn my attention towards the topic of our panel today in relation to environmental contamination and public health. I share an excerpt from an article I'm working on around the entangled discourses of injury and risk and legal and medical assessments of toxic exposure following spill events across the Navajo Nation. I draw upon ethnographic experiences attending and participating with community coalitions in response to uranium contamination in order to articulate the ambiguous and uneven applications of regulatory accountability that mirror longer settler histories of legal disenfranchisement. Uh, and just really briefly what I want to point out here, um, there are over 500 abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation. Um, this is stemming to a Cold War legacy. Um, as of 2005, the Navajo Nation has a moratorium on uranium mining um, due to efforts of um, grassroots coalitions on the Navajo Nation. Um, however, just because this, um, this law was passed does, does not attend to this toxic legacy. Um, so you have in, like in the case that I'm working on, you know, water contamination. This is also a place that's a downwinder region, right? Stemming from um, nuclear testing. Um, so the, you know, the air, the dust, everything in this, this region is, is rendered toxic. Um, and as you can see, the Hopi reservation is, is also a, in the midst of the Navajo Nation. Um, so there's, there's competing geopolitical and jurisdictions over these larger um, ancestral territories. The Valley Baptist Church felt smaller than usual this evening in early December 2015. The pews quickly filled as Sanders community members found their seats for the special meeting. Warmth expanded as more bodies crowded the space and dissipated just as soon as another resident opened the wooden door at the front entrance. Meanwhile, an artificial Christmas tree erected near the pulpit flickered fiber optic brilliance. Green, blue, red, yellow, repeat. The erratic light cast ominous shadows throughout the room as residents awaited the public health assessment of their drinking water. On the wall, made explicitly visible for the Sunday congregation, are a few carved wooden signs with the words Jesus and love inscribed within the shape of a fish. Glancing over, I see an empty space behind the altar, almost like a small room with a window opening to the church. Is that area for the choir? I casually ask my pew companion. Oh no, they respond, that's for the baptisms. I contemplate silently on an imagined baptismal scene, the basin filled with uranium-laden water, a new convert awaiting their salvation, and then a toxic submersion. Toxicity has a way of lingering in bodies and ephemeral thoughts. The irony often feels cruel. After the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality public notice of uranium elevations was sent by mail in early August of that year, residents demanded a reinterpretation of the recommendation. Therefore, ADE ADEQ was enlisted as a neutral third party to offer an independent analysis of water sampling data in consideration of public health risks. It took three months before results of the new analysis would be shared with residents during another special weekly meeting. Two officials from the Arizona Department of Health began by describing their methodology of collection site data and to identifying the exposure pathways and comparing the data with the screening value in order to assess the so-called risk categorization. In this case, the epidemiologist explains how they used comparison values of 110 parts per billion for adults and children. With this set of values, she explains how the average uranium concentration of 59.5 parts per billion is above the toxicological threshold for children, but not for adults. Therefore, they conclude that the water is not expected to harm human health, with exception of possible effect for infants younger than one year old. Given the fact that these values are significantly higher than the federal drinking water standard of 30 parts per billion, Community members grew confused and upset over the assessment. Here I want to, um, for any of you who are scientifically inclined, um, 
110 parts per billion is really high. Um, so 30 parts per billion or micrograms per liter is what is acceptable in US drinking water standards. Um, and it was really hard to explain this to community members. I mean, I myself, even though I'm a researcher, you know, I had to learn all, like going onto the EPA website, the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality website, to understand what was acceptable for water quality data. And I don't know how many of you off the top of your head understand um, what is considered you know, toxic or acceptable for your drinking water. Um, so after all of this, you know, I, I actually encourage you to um, better understand what's in your drinking water because a lot of these values are, are set unusually high and it's normalized um, basically to, to accommodate industry, which I will explain further. With the on onslaught of so many contaminants, how can there be certainty that the contaminated water was not partially to blame? Why are public health officials denying the possibility of adverse health effects? This is their job after all. What can be gained by minimizing exposure risk? Indeed, by utilizing the 110 parts per billion as threshold as opposed to 30 parts per billion effectively renders the MCL maximum contaminant level meaningless. In this way, regulatory enforcement functions akin to a sort of sovereign exception, whereby regulatory agencies decide when to apply exceptions to federal drinking water standards or not. Per the radionuclides final rule, the regulatory revision set monitoring requirements for radionuclides, including the MCL contaminant limit. Um, a deadline as of December 31st, 2007 was established for all community water systems to compile initial monitoring. That means before this date, uranium was not regulated by the 1976 drinking water standards. And this spill was in 1979, as you recall. The 1986 Safe Drinking Water Act amendments included uranium as one of 83 contaminated, contaminants to be listed in drinking water. In 1991, the US EPA proposed a limit on uranium of 20 micrograms per liter per, to protect against kidney toxicity. In fact, the US EPA considered MCL regulations for uranium in ranges for 20, 40, and 80 micrograms per liter, taking into account public health and cost analysis. Lab costs associated with radionuclide sampling are rather expensive, thus becoming a perceived hindrance for, for small water systems, in addition to infrastructure costs to bring deficient systems in compliance. As a result, drinking water MCL regulations were set higher than what they should be to accommodate systems that would otherwise be so out of compliance that they would need improvements that would cost too much. So once again, they considered drinking water standards um, lower than uh, in consideration of human health, but they ended up setting them higher because otherwise it would cost too much for systems to come into compliance. So this is basically to defer to, to corporate and small water systems. This means that compliance cost is a major consideration weighed against human health. By comparison, in 2009, Canada adopted a uranium standard of 20 micrograms per liter, while in Germany, in 2011, they adopted an even lower standard of 10 micrograms per liter. Therefore, in the US, our 30 micrograms per liter uh, assessment is already too high, reflecting a deference to water system compliance and ultimately business operation over concerns of human health. In Sanders, as in other communities of color, unraveling, unraveling the web of repeated denials and omissions reveals the endurance of environmental racism, what Robert Bullard calls the link in the chain of unsustainable development and globalization. These environmental in inequalities traverse geographic and social dichotomies in the form of global waste trade and transnational resistance movements, industrial contamination and local activism, and the production of identity politics in the so-called subaltern environmental struggle, struggles. And I'm referring to Laura Polito's work here. For instance, numerous studies have documented how communities of color are exposed disproportionately to higher amounts of toxic contaminants, such as outdoor and indoor air pollution. Moreover, studies have shown how tribal populations experience greater frequency of health disparities than other groups in the United States. 
Such statistics inform the insight that environmental regulations are unevenly applied along racial and class lines, and as such are often unclearly defined in enforcement, especially in small community water systems where there is less incentive to monitor compliance. The distinction in Sanders is not only a racial one, but also a territorial and jurisdictional one, stemming from the limitations of tribal sovereignty and issues of environmental regulation, especially in these checkerboard regions. Um, and I want to point out here that the Navajo Nation has its own environmental protection agency. Um, and actually, many tribes do have their own enforcement agencies, which can function akin to like a state level um, environmental agency. But because Sanders is that two um, square mile parcel of land that is technically not the Navajo Nation, um, the Navajo EPA had no jurisdiction, even though these were Diné residents whose health was at risk. Um, therefore, the environmental justice paradigm alone is insufficient to address indigenous concerns around the protection of land and water, not to mention unique treaty obligations for each tribal nation. Recent mobilizations at Standing Rock demanding treaty recognition as well as environmental impact assessments illustrate the stakes of environmental protection and upholding tribal sovereignty, not to mention how the sanctioning of one form of violence such as militarized law enforcement against unarmed indigenous water protectors is directly related to other modes of violence wrought by environmental racism and neoliberal expansion. These critical engagements with ecological destruction intersect with other forms of state sanctioned violence, such as with Black Lives Matter and sexual violence against Native women. Um, and for those of you who are more uh, visually inclined, this just gives um, a, another look at the exceedances of uranium contamination in this community. This was compiled um, uh, by my colleague, Tommy Rock, who is a Diné environmental scientist. Um, so in all of this, I, I want to privilege uh, the work of indigenous scientists. Um, I think sometimes there's this binary that somehow traditional knowledge and Western science are oppositional. And I think there's actually ways as this, um, you know, Dr. Rock's work and other Diné scientists are showing is it's not about um, rejecting Western um, scientific knowledge, but it's actually about who controls that knowledge production. Um, so, you know, Dr. Rock did this um, environmental justice study looking at unreg unregulated water sources um, in the Puerco Valley, and this is when he discovered there was elevations in, in the groundwater. Um, had it been another researcher, this might not have been brought to light, but because um, he's Diné and was more familiar with the region, he was more familiar with how to translate these concepts before a Diné community, this is how um, this galvanized this, this um, Diné public response to the water contamination. Um, another point on um, small community water systems and a lack of oversight, um, they, this is how uh, this water system was cleaning the water. Um, these abandoned Clorox bottles were found near the community well site, so basically they were just dumping Clorox into the water to clean it. Um, nowhere is this entanglement of violence more explicit than in and upon female bodies. Indeed, the so-called reference man is defined as a person with, quote, anatomical and physiological characteristics of an average individual that is used in calculations assessing internal dose, according to the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. He is described as being between 20 to 30 years of age, weighing 154 pounds, 5 feet 7 inches in height, and lives in a climate with an average temperature of 10 to 20 degrees Celsius. He is Caucasian and is of Western European or North American inhabit and custom. How many of you fit that bill here? No. Um, and this is according to the Internal Commission on Radiological Protection of 1975. Um, I like showing this image um, alongside that quote. Um, this was produced by um, an artist with the radi Radiation Monitoring Project. Um, so this was a group that also um, worked in Sanders' community to help teach, um, I guess what you could call community science, um, and teaching residents how to use radiation monitors um, so we could try to understand um, 
some of the uranium elevations within this community, um, just as Dr. Rock also taught residents how to take water samples. Um, so once again, this is not about you know, denying the tools of like Western science, but rather putting that knowledge and those tools into community members' hands so that moving forward, um, they have a better understanding of how to approach these problems. Um, and I, I mean, this is actually a really frightening image, um, but it, you know, it depicts a Diné woman with um, a baby in her womb, and it has the corresponding radioactive elements and where they would um, proliferate within the body along with the half-life um, designation, which I said is pretty frightening. Um, so this, this standard of the white male that I just uh, explained is also used by the Environmental Protection Agency and Department of Energy. So it, when you're thinking about these public health assessments and what, what is considered to be um, you know, a legal dose of, of uranium in your drinking water, um, the person drinking that water would be presumed to be this, this white male. So this does not account for the effects on, say, a pregnant woman or on a child. Um, so the male standard not only obscures the presence of toxicity in female bodies, but it al also overlooks the numerous pathways and effects from exposures beyond large-scale nuclear events. The presumed veracity of reference ranges from MCL standards to expected life outcomes are all based on a fantasy of an ideal white male subject. Shifting research methodological practices and frames of analysis is a challenge when industry standards are largely based on these limited models. Therefore, beginning to define Diné conceptualizations of environmental contamination is a start. In these contexts, discourses of risk and trauma imply the need for healing in all its myriad imaginings as a desired corrective. Clear forms of accountability and remediation often remain just as elusive as the contaminant itself. Nevertheless, attending to the specific social cultural context of contamination needs to be further developed in regulatory practices, as well for us as scholars to better understand the entangled legacies of extraction and exposure in indigenous landscapes and bodies. Thank you. Am I the only one going to be high? Any questions? generational dynamics, right? Either where it's not being considered or it is, or particular things are being framed later on and earlier on, right? So I'm struck by um, the, the fact that the book is, one of the examples of the book is the daughter's use of it, right? And you mentioned Sequoia's children, right? So there are a couple things also in terms of um, both, uh, right, the impact on children versus adults. And mm -hmm. of course, my question is always also like, what about elders? Because mm -hmm. those are never considered mm -hmm. in the US. But Right, so there's a lot of generational things going on that never, uh, I would say, often don't seem to be at the forefront, but are, in community-wise, often what people are considering. So I didn't mm -hmm. know if you guys would like, reflect on that, either in terms of the context you're researching or the ways that like academic and institutional generations happen, right? So these things become inscribed as ways of knowing or assumed truths, even, and we lose some of those. Oh. Okay. Well, I guess the one thing I'll say off the top of my head in terms of generations, um, as I'm thinking through um, 
like social activism or indigenous social movements. Um, you know, and I, I went to Standing Rock, I was involved in, um, in activism in New York, um, which is where I did my PhD. Um, so, I, and there definitely, I think, is a, a lot of attention paid, and rightfully so, towards indigenous activism, and it's focused on the youth. Um, but I think what falls away a lot in this is the role of elders and the role of um, other, other generations who maybe are not as, um, they're not as visible, because they're not going to be the ones who are on the front lines, um, who are, you know, standing, standing off with police. But they're the ones from whom we've derived this knowledge. Um, and in the case of you know, Sanders, um, most of the people who were mobilizing um, in this case were like middle age or elders. Um, so they had full time jobs, right? Um, so their, their sort of activism wasn't um, enabled by some sort of ideological framework of what settler colonialism is or, or, or social justice, but really it was just a desire um, to protect their livelihood. Like that was, that was the framework that they used. Like their discourse was like protecting our lives and our livelihood, having clean water. Um, and I think that's something that we, we all can um, kind of rally around. But trying to articulate that and theorize that sometimes becomes more difficult um, because middle age, middle age, like a middle age generation, um, yeah, it kind of lacks some of the sexiness that, that we see, you know, with like looking at it like, like youth. Um, so I haven't like formally written anything about this, um, but it's something that I've definitely been thinking about in terms of like the roles of, of, of generations and how we were talking about that in indigenous studies. And I will pass this. Do you need the camera mic as well or uh, do I have to use both of them? Yeah, okay, okay. Um, Jenny, <laughs> thank you for the question. It's um, so generative and smart. Um, so I'm, one of the things that, that thinking with Laurent's book and thinking with the people who use the book really helped me think about was the ways that if we trace the circulations and the uses of the book, it opens up how we might think about its creation and production and its lives. So we might position Laurent as the author. His name is certainly the, the name on the title page. But thinking through how he got the linguistic information to include in the um, lists of words and the dialogues is probably a consultative process involving elders and language experts. And then I think Octavi gives us a little window into the ways that his daughter and other children who were at the camp would have been using and circulating the book. It's also the case that his youngest son, Stephen Laurent, moves um, from Odenac in Quebec to New Hampshire near the camp and spends the rest of his life there starting in the 1950s to about the 1990s when he passes. And, and he is continuing the language work and he's doing things like remapping French maps by putting Abenaki words on them. Um, so to think about all of the things that the book kind of generates across the generations um, that opens up to us if we think not just about the content on the pages, but how people are interacting with it and using the book as a, um, an object and a tool and a family possession that is shared and passed down amongst folks. Thank you for this question. It's so smart. Um, so since my research involves the study of plantation slavery and how Native people deal with that institution. Um, the question of um, youth and vitality becomes really important because that's how people are using native bodies to create um, tobacco production and rice production. So um, part of the transformation of kinship relationships um, is kind of a devaluating of elders, right, with from the planter's perspective, right? Um, and part of the resistance to that is trying to keep those memories alive in native um, enslaved communities. And I think as historians, one of the things we're trying to reckon with is how to change our regular approach to uh, timelines and temporality in our work because, um, you know, a lot oftentimes like we, we like to study 10 years, right? Or we like to study one year, right? We go in Western forms of, um, you know, logic about time um, and generations. And I think Native Americanists um, working in history are really reckoning with the fact that doesn't really work, right? If, you say, if you're trying to write a history of like Native people, you need to think within their own frameworks of how history is told and um, timelines are developed. And this may seem very like, you know, obvious to folks doing Native studies, but I think it's something that historians are still really trying to incorporate. Um, and like the Western term, right, would be the long durée, 
But you know, what does that mean actually when we're using, <laughs> we're doing NACE, right? <laughs> Lisa Brooks is doing the, the best stuff on that, right? I think, yeah, <laughs> the spiral. Um, I guess I'll just say um, UIC um, just produced uh, a really interesting report on um, the American Indian community in Chicago um, that was incredibly useful um, because one of the problems that um, community members and researchers were finding as they tried to apply for grants from anything on like health or uh, dealing with issues of like prison justice reform, like Native women are incarcerated at incredibly high rates in Illinois. Um, anything to do with like community protection, environmental, anything in Chicago, f folks just didn't have numbers on Native community members. Like people didn't know who was living there um, to write these grants, right? Like individual community members know, right? The American Indian Center has, you know, um, wells of information, but it had never been put together in a report that was citable to write these grants. So one of the things that UIC did was to try to put some resources behind finding some data about the American, um, Indian community in Chicago. So I guess, I mean, and like, you know, we came from the, I came from the reports, um, we had a big ceremony for it and like I brought it to our Native Studies workshop and I was like, guys, check this out, you know. Um, so I guess, you know, we're all, uh, from, that's a, a little UIC story, but I think we're all kind of engaged in trying to figure out, um, you know, how our work can be involved in uh, the community. And these folks have way more to say about that. <laughs> Uh, I feel like there's so many ways to answer this yeah, question. A lot. Haley and I were talking on the way down about the, so we're both working in early fields and the way that yeah. those fields um, have grappled and not grappled with the question of life, but by which we might take that to be like the present or the contemporary. And so I was telling a story about um, being a dissertation student and reaching out to a senior scholar at another institution and saying, like, do you have suggestions or could I, could you offer some mentoring around the question of how I do work that might be in collaboration and in um, relationship and conversation with Native communities and people. And the response um, was was helpful, but also sort of like, it's, it's generally the case that early Americanists are doing things that aren't important for Native communities. And so there's a kind of limit to like what that relationship is gonna be like. And I think that is on the one hand true, insofar as I think it's important to recognize that like, our academic books may or may not have impacts on communities. But I also have come to want to push against that insofar as I want to think about how my own work, while it might be about the 18th and 19th centuries, might actually be able to be in conversation with and matter for and be taken up by um, Native communities, folks who are using uh, Joseph Laurent's book today to, to learn language. And that I think requires a shift in early American studies methodologies um, in order to figure out how we might not just talk with archives or to each other, but expand the realm of folks we talk with and the um, places we consider knowledge to be held and so on. Um, so I think about that as a kind of ongoing challenge to fields that historically have defined themselves as having to do primarily with representation and not about life, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But also uh, I want to push on the idea that representation uh, matters less than other kinds of um, things, objects, documents, work. Um, so I'm teaching a class, um, a, a 300 level seminar at my institution, and we're reading Black Hawk's Life this year, um, or sorry, this week. You can tell it's midterms because I'm like, I don't know what time it is. Um, and so one of the things we talked about is the um, mascot for the Black Hawks in Chicago and the ways that images and representations continue to circulate and do real harm to life and do real harm to yeah. minds. And so to really think about the stakes of representation as not being actually disconnected from life, but intimately connected um, to it and involving really high stakes. Mm -hmm. 
Um, well, I suppose, I mean, with the, the examples I gave, um, and thinking through like water is life, which is, uh, I mean, I think a rallying cry that we're all familiar with, but certainly preceded um, the Standing Rock moment. Um, you know, I actually, I, I came into this work, you know, one, I was trained as an anthropologist, um, and anthropology has a really dirty history in native communities, and rightfully so, and I would be the first to not defend anthropology. Um, nevertheless, I, I found myself drawn to anthropology because of its methodology. Um, so that's, that's like the one, the one thing that when people ask me, like, oh, you're a Navajo and you're an anthropologist, you know, and that Brian Delore has that joke, you know, about, yeah, yeah. you know, every Navajo family has an anthropologist, <laughs> um, which is kind of true. Um, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it gave me the opportunity to go back home for a year. Um, and I, I, I started out with a project where I was interested in, in these more informal ways of articulating um, Navajo sovereignty. So the questions of territory, right, this, this community of Sanders and this former checkerboard region. Um, so how does Diné politics operate there? The questions of environmental contamination um, emerged because right when I was starting my project, they had this community water crisis. And then another aspect of my research was looking at the 2015 Gold King mine spill. So suddenly, I had a new lens by which to, to look at these kind of entangled logics of sovereignty. And it was really through contamination. Um, and so the question of life and livelihood um, really, you know, I think came to the forefront. And so it, it, that became what my project was. And it wasn't because this was a research project, but it was literally because my family members were like, we need your help. You know how to do research. Um, can you help us imagine a lawsuit? So then we were trying to do research on different legal strategies, you know, like w going through like a small tort claim or, um, and kind of just trying to imagine a way to remediate the situation. Um, and so I think in that way, um, and kind of thinking through you know, the importance of indigenous methodologies is doing projects that are meaningful to the community. Um, and also the community is not a monolithic thing. Um, but also, you know, I think attending to our various relationships. Um, you know, I, I hope and I, I encourage um, other anthropologists to be doing projects that are within their own communities, however that's broadly defined. Um, you know, not going to some exotic faraway place and trying to like save <laughs> a culture which functions almost like missionary sort of work. Um, but I, I mean, I do see like increasingly that um, other anthropologists are trying to do, to do that sort of work. And so that's where I see kind of a glimmer of hope. Um, but really it's just being accountable and defining new sorts of relationships. And I think Kim Talber, um, you know, she has this piece that she wrote for the AAA a few years ago, and it was right around Standing Rock time. Um, you know, and it's, it's, about, it's about recognizing, you know, kinship. And even if you're not Native, you still have a form of, like, accountability. And you have to actually go that much and above and beyond to make yourself accountable to um, communities that you're working in. Um, yeah. Uh, it's kind of an extension of what you were just saying, but I'm just kind of wondering, um, in terms of research, doing research with indigenous communities as either an insider or an outsider, what kinds of issues have you come across as researchers working with indigenous families? Um, there's a lot to say here too. <laughs> So one of the things that I have been happy to learn about through a collaboration with the American Indian Center of Chicago um, and a grant that we put together to do some work to digitize their photography archives is the ways that there's sometimes a mismatch between like how um, universities, academics, granting agencies imagine projects and what actually ends up being useful on the ground. And so just attention to the ways that and I mean that in a couple ways, like one, attention to the ways that things are actually useful and the ways in which we as scholars can be accountable, but also attention to the ways that work is already happening. And so like the collaboration needs to account for that, right? So like one of the great things that I learned um, and that came out of that archive project was that 
like Chicago is a city with many archives. The Newberry Library is there. There's like National Archives, local branch. But like the AIC has an archive of its history and its uh, people and past and um, it's ongoing. And so um, the grant was sort of for at-risk archives, but it turned out this was an archive that was flourishing and was um, people knew about it and they knew what was in there. And so shifting the kind of frameworks for um, uh, narrating need um, in order to attend to what's actually there. But then I also try to think about the ways that I can um, take the resources of a place like Northwestern and bend them in ways that end up being actually productively useful for folks. So maybe that involves working with a category that isn't quite a fit to get things that are useful and then kind of reinterpret those categories back to the university or the granting agency. That's a little abstract. Um, one of the um, one of the suggestions I have for um, historians is to um, well I guess and, and everybody but specifically historians um, is to think about how your skills as a scholar and as your institutional affiliations like what those can offer the the communities you're working with. So for instance, I sit and look at 17th century documents all day. That's what I'm trained to do. That's what I understand, and that's what I've been I have the time to do. Um, this is not something that um, like the Pamunkey uh, tribal historian who I work with has time to do right now. Um, so what I've done is just you know bring thumb drives over of documents and just say, hey, you might be interested in this. I don't know, this might apply to what you're thinking about. One of the figures I write about um, was important in their, um, um, in their uh, recognition documents. Um, this is, the Pamunkeys have a fascinating story. They got federal recognition in 2015, in spite of the fact that they are descended from America's favorite Indian, Pocahontas. Um, and so um, that was a very intense struggle for them. And they're still putting together some of the histories, um, especially the early histories, um, in their museum and working on that stuff. It's always, it's always an ongoing project. So from a really practical standpoint, it, it comes from like writing an email and saying, hi, you know, this is what I do. Would this be useful to you guys? You know, because you don't know. You don't know what they're working on. You don't know. You know, every nation is different. Teresa, you know, gets hounded, you know, to like have, you know, answer questions about all these different native nations. But every institution and every nation is, you know, different and working on their own things. So you just kind of have to think about how your personal skills can can help communities. What you just said reminded me of something. Um, I mean, thinking about the category of indigenous to, to, to trouble this, you know, which is kind of, I guess, derived from the United Nations, right? Um, the UNDRIP document. Um, while, it, this, while it also gives us a, a, a sense of empowerment and solidarity globally to think through our connected struggles, um, at the same time, um, what it also does is it, it conflates our experiences insofar as like what you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. I, I get emails all the time as the sole native faculty um, to speak on behalf of other indigenous nations issues or histories or it's like, oh, but if you're a native, then wouldn't, <laughs> wouldn't you know something about this Northwest Coast issue or, um, and so I've, I'm constantly having to deflect and remind people that, yes, you know, I'm indigenous and I'm, um, but first and foremost, you know, I'm, I'm Diné, I'm a citizen of the Navajo Nation and even having to like, de distinguish between those two categories, right? Diné being a, a cultural category, like that's who I am as a, as a Diné woman, versus Navajo, which is a political category. I have Navajo citizenship. Um, and so a lot of times, um, you know, our nation names may have colonial, um, colonial roots, you know, Navajo, you know, actually being of Spanish origin, and it was because in these old Spanish campaign journals, they thought that we were Apache. Um, you know, so the the fact that we are the Navajo Nation, you know, there's there's been debates about changing that. Should it be the Diné Nation, right? Returning to our so-called pre-colonial name. There's a lot of like baggage and complications around that. So for any time that you um, you know want to approach an indigenous person or indigenous subject, I mean, just doing a Google search and trying to understand, um, you know, one, the origins of, of, that, of that nation's name or the different like cultural categories, I think is, is really useful. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, a lot of us uh, scholars of color are always having to ride the line between 
wanting to help and advocate and educate because this is why we went into this profession and it's deeply rewarding and gratifying, but it's also incredibly exhausting when at the end of the day, I'm having to do all of this labor to, to teach people not just about my own nation and experience as a researcher, but also to try to explain you know, my role within this larger um, global indigenous uh, subjectivity. Um, and that this, this can be true to any sort of um, category, um, you know, gender, racial, or otherwise. Um, but yeah, I kind of just wanted to open up the space, maybe we talk about some of those issues as well, like categories that we use that in Native Studies itself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Do we have like one, one more question maybe? I, I saw you again went up first. I mean, I, it might be useful here just to speak a little bit about um, Northwestern and its place in Illinois, a place, as you know, that has no federally recognized tribes within its state boundaries, um, a, a place that is, um, uh, we could talk about the campus and the fact that much of it is built on Lake Phil and the fact that that Lake Phil was not included in the 1833 Treaty of Chicago um, and the fact that the Potawatomi, Pokagon Potawatomi Band has um, had lawsuits to try to get the courts to recognize that they did not cede the lake, um, but only the lands on which Chicago sat. So to think about Northwestern as sitting on unceded lands. Um, but I also think about the fact that Northwestern, one of its founders is John Evans, who's the territorial governor of Colorado and responsible for the Sand Creek Massacre. Um, and so to think about the geopolitics, not just of being in Illinois, um, but also Northwestern's relationships to Cheyenne and Arapaho people to whom the institution bears a historical mm -hmm. debt and responsibility. Um, and, and I think about that as a non-native scholar at Northwestern um, on indigenous land. So I don't know that I have, I don't know that I have like an answer as far as like, <laughs> here's how we do this, but just to say that I think one of the things that I have um, really learned and thought a lot about in my time at Northwestern is the kind of multiple layers of these geopolitical relationships between native nations among indigenous communities like the one in Chicago that's full of many indigenous nations, right. um, like the ones that involve a place like Chicago, which is home to multiple indigenous nations, and like the ones to which Northwestern is connected through its debt to John Evans, and I think here about railroads, which connect Chicago to Colorado, and which Evans was essential in helping to build. Um, so I think I just maybe think about the kind of overlapping entanglements that your talk spoke yeah. to as being essential to trying to attend to and not lose sight of all of those overlapping um, geopolitical relations. Um, yeah, so it's kind of riffing off of the idea of entanglement, which is uh, Jean, Jean Dennison's term. She's an O'Shade scholar. Um, or even Audra Simpson's notion of nested sovereignty. And I'm, you know, what I'm trying to theorize is, you know, is the layered ways that sovereignty functions. Um, and also, you know, sovereignty means many different things to many different people. It can be, it's a symbolic and ideological category, but it's also a very territorially bounded category. Um, and so I guess I want to say um, is, you know, the, what does it mean when we recognize this as, in, as indigenous land? And attending to th this fact you just pointed out, when there's 
there's no geopolitical um, recognition, right, of, of, of there being a reservation here. Um, so I, I'm thinking through a lot of the work um, that indigenous people are doing on lands that extend beyond their current geopolitical boundaries. And of course, mm -hmm. that's basically everywhere. Um, so today, for instance, in class, uh, my colleague collaborator here, Angelo Baca came and he showed his film Shash Ja, and we were talking about um, how Bears Ears National Monument, for those of you who are familiar with this struggle in, um, in southeastern Utah, it's a public land struggle. Um, this is land that's ancestral land to multiple tribes in the region, um, to Diné, to Hopi, Ute, Zuni, um, but it's, it's not on any of our current like tribal territories. Um, so it's not legible right. um, to like federal categories of recognition. Right. Right. Nevertheless, you have a group of indigenous nations who are coming together to protect this land. And so I think that if you want like a, a contemporary um, example of like how nations are coming together and kind of refusing or pushing back against these categories, pushing back against these very small geopolitical uh, boundaries and reservations, you know, I think like Bears Ears is an, ex an excellent example of that mm -hmm. um, because it really is, it's elevating and, you know, defining indigenous land, um, kind of longevity of ancestral lands. Um, and that's kind of the double bind of sovereignty itself right. it, that indigenous scholars are working through is like a lot of our livelihood and identity is tied up in categories of tribal sovereignty, even though those categories itself are very limiting and exclusionary. So you kind of have to hold those two things together. It's like, how do you uphold tribal sovereignty while at the same time recognizing that our relationships and identities actually exist beyond that? Um, maybe that's maybe a good thing to end on, but... Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.